my name is Philip Martin, and I'm really delighted that you could join us today. I am the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery with uh, Portia Heim, and I hope that you've had a chance to uh, meet Portia or come see the gallery either here in person or virtually or at one of the fairs. Um, I am delighted today to be talking with Lori Nye. This is a conversation that I've really been looking forward to. And this is, of course, in conjunction with our show, Sugar Tree Landing, which is up right now. Um, everything, of course, you know, if you have any questions about any of the work, just feel free to email me or let me know anything that, um, any questions that you might have. Everything, of course, you know, is available, is for sale, and we can have that conversation if you want to. And, of course, um, we will put this uh, on our website, along with a lot of other great conversations that we've had um during COVID. So again, I'm really excited that you've ha made a chance to be here. So Lori, how are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for asking. Well, it's a pleasure to be working on this show with you. I mean, it's a beautiful exhibition and um, maybe we just jump right in. This is a piece called Tree of Andromeda. Tell me a little bit about your titles. Um, you know, my titles are kind of all over the place and sometimes they're self-referential, sometimes they're from personal, something related personally. I was thinking about a painting last night that's from a song that I love. Um, this one is like kind of nodding back to past work. I did a show called Andromeda. Um, and so this kind of references back to that. And that's, that's just where the, the painting title came from. Um, but people that know my work from way back kind of know what it what it references. Well, I might ask you some more questions. You want to talk to us a little bit about, you know, how you put the paintings together or how this painting came about? This painting kind of stemmed from another painting I did. Um, I did a painting before this one called, which we will talk about in a minute, which is Ovid's Forest. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I was really getting into this. I've been, I'd been doing some drawings and pastels and was getting into this kind of organicism and I was looking back to kind of Nouveau and the, the kinds of like, you know, those kinds of lines and, and the way things are designed. And I'm always like, you know, that's just kind of the way I draw anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, I knew I wanted to kind of focus on trees. Uh -huh. They're really totemic and really interesting to me. And I read this book, um, what was the name of the book? But it was like a science fiction book called The, Wor the Word her world is forest uh -huh. and it's an Ursula Le Guin book. And uh -huh. so I've read that book and knew I wanted to go back into landscape based off of just like reading that book. Uh -huh. So they're kind of otherworldly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was, I, I look at a lot of different things. So I was thinking a lot about the design um, of the painting and, and basically starting with drawings with these. I don't typically start with a drawing, but for this one I did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really kind of painted it very similarly to the drawing. So um, I just loved the drawing. I was like, this could be a really good painting. Well, <laughs> you know, what's gonna happen when this becomes like a big piece, you know, like, and then I did something different with the painting because, um, you know, I needed to, I have this desire to like fill in space. Like, uh -huh. so I couldn't just leave it empty. So you, you like, when you see the painting in person, there's all that flora fauna stuff. There's a lot of little like secret secrets in there. There's a lot of little flowers that, that are in places you wouldn't expect, like where's Waldo or something. Um, and that comes from probably my background way back when I was doing surface design. So I used to paint on silk and do batik and that's what I did in undergrad. And I think that that kind of desire to fill in the spaces comes from that, like working on a flat surface and working with like a kind of flatness, um, it's still kind of ingrained in me, you know, when I'm working on a painting. So you've used the word design a couple times. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's a lot of different ways that I think about painting, you mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of different ways that I come to a painting. Um, and when I'm drawing, especially, I think I I think there's a design involved, you know, there's mm -hmm. a tendency to think about positive and negative, you know, mm -hmm. lines, shapes, forms, things that are very, you know, 
cut and dry basic kinds of elements. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the other part of me, it comes from kind of a very intuitive place, mm -hmm. intuitive way of making. So I combine those things when I'm trying to make a painting, you know, there's the intuitive thing, but I don't, you know, like, I don't necessarily let completely go and just whatever. There's also these other things that, that are inherently learned, you know, from being an art student or, you know, from drawing since I was a very little kid and just things I've learned over time um, that I involve, you know, in a painting or that I want to see mm -hmm. uh, in a painting. So yeah, design. So when you talk about kind of filling in spaces or being involved in spaces in the painting, I mean, talk to us, uh, unpack that for us a little, a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think it happened, it really did happen even more when I was working with the pastel. The pastel was doing something that, like I said, you know, I, my background initially when I was an undergrad was surface design. So I was mm -hmm. painting on silk and everything was one continuous line. Mm -hmm. And this is something I teach actually, you know, as a professor, I teach about we do drawings that way. We mm -hmm. learn to draw that way. We learn to see that way. So when I was painting in Batik, everything was one continuous line. And I was trying to make a painting on silk. So it was so interesting because my other professors were like, you're not a surface designer, you're a painter. Uh -huh. And and I was like, really? You know, so, you know, there's this impetus like I that I want to fill in the space with something. I'm, you know, like, I'm just drawn to that. I don't know what that is. Um, I'm, I look at, you know, surface design, like things like this and uh -huh. get excited. Um, but I get really excited by big abstract paintings too. Yeah. So there's a desire to like, can I put this all in one painting? Can I put something that's abstracted? And can I put something that's, uh, you know, descriptive also in a painting? Right. Um, so I try to do, both. I mean, and I think it's become much more intuitive. Like I, I can see it when I look at it afterwards. I don't always know that I'm doing it at the time, but I, I know that I think about these things a lot and I think everything kind of comes together in a specific way. And my paintings um, that come from my drawings and come yeah. from paintings too. Come well, together. it's an interesting process, I think, as, as a viewer, because you have this experience, or I do, looking at your work, where you have a strong sense of line, a strong sense of shape, a strong sense of color areas. And those are things that tell you about the painting, how it's made, what, what the surface is. But then, of course, you have these incredible vistas opening in front of you or you know, because it's often kind of wooded scenes, maybe it's not a vista in the like sense of looking across a giant landscape, but it's that kind of real engagement with um, with the place and disappearing into it. And so when you're talking about creating a feeling of line and, and design and using this phrase surface design, which I, I will admit, I actually don't know a great deal about, but I assume what you mean is sort of more like textiles and, and things like that. Um, I, I, I am seeing this play and feeling that play. It's answering some questions for me about my own experience looking at these works because I'm they're both incredibly absorptive, but also, um, also you have a very strong sense of some of the surface and those tools that I mentioned. Yeah, it's just a, I think it's a nice meld of the two, you know, I think that's something kind of unique to me, you know, possibly. And this is a newer pace. You want to talk to us a little bit about, about this work? Yeah, talk about design. Um, this kind of like is so pared down. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when I, I made, I made a, like a summer series. I made a bunch of paintings this summer and mm -hmm. I was kind of just experimenting and trying a lot of different things and really, you know, it was all nature oriented mostly, but um, I did a, a painting of an iris Mm -hmm. um, and a painting of a sunflower. And uh, I really enjoyed just focusing in on one form mm -hmm. and kind of playing around with 
the organicism versus the kind of structuralism that I'm always playing with in paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but in a very kind of like simplified, tight way. Um, mm -hmm. And it happened, you know, these happened pretty quickly in terms of the drawing aspect. So I just drew this on the canvas um, in charcoal. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's new for me to do. And I kind of had fun with that because there's a freedom to just like erasing the charcoal and, you know, you're not committed to it. Right. Um, so I did that and um, I am looking at flowers a lot more and have been, I mean, I, I've been looking at them forever, but as a form um, mm -hmm. to play with, I think that flowers are such an interesting form um, to look at and the color and um, they give me a sense of feeling of like a place um, and that is something I think a lot about is place and just like living in LA, which I'm in Tennessee right now, but right. living in LA, I think a lot about Tennessee. I think a lot about like growing up in Tennessee and the verdant kind of landscape um, here. Um, and I miss it. And the, there's a verdancy there. Is that a word? Verdancy? There's like a verdance, <laughs> whatever the word is, there's like, LA obviously is like tropical and yeah. beautiful and and there's so many things there that I definitely point to in my paintings, like this one especially. Um, you know, the parrots um, in Pasadena and that fly all around LA, they're just the parrots everywhere. Right now, the parrot situation right now is out of control. They just showed up in Eagle Rock, which is obviously, which is where I live. And there are just massive flocks, massive flocks. And, it is interesting, you know, LA as a landscape is totally different than Tennessee. And obviously I'm, I don't know, I'm from Indiana. So I feel that very strongly. There are greens, for example, that I see in Indiana that you would ne never see here. Like literally, I don't never see the color. It's one of the things that strikes me so strongly in my life is this awareness of totally different places. I knew, I feel like I really didn't understand California and how different it was until I started gardening here, which was, you know, 10 years after I had lived here, I finally had a garden. And, um, you know, you just realize that, you know, like right now when the rain comes, like that's kind of our summer, you know, it's when the landscape is sort of most opened up and it's, you know, and these parrots are, I don't know where they escaped from, but like, you know, showing up and having this kind of time Anyway, that's a kind of long response to those differences in, in feeling. Yeah, I uh, when I first lived in LA, I mean, I lived in Silver Lake and then I moved to past South Pasadena and I lived mm -hmm. in South Pass because I loved it there because it reminded me of home because there was yeah. some greenery and there were some big yeah. trees. Yeah. And I lived there before it got too crazy. It's like super crazy now. Like uh, a lot of people live there, but um, I remember just like the parents, like I was just so fascinated that they were there. And then there was that documentary, Parrots of Telegraph Hill, that kind of talks huh? about the origins of the, of the parrots. Sure. Anyway, it's in its, yeah, yeah, they're just something that's so fascinating to me that I love about Los Angeles, you know, how kooky it is and how strange the landscape is and how there's so much exotic, exotica mm -hmm. of like flora and fauna brought in um, that is just like always there for you to see. Well, I do think that's one of those things that they've even at the Huntington, they kind of made that point that part of the history of LA, when you look around the landscape is that you can see all of these different trends in, in garden design and what people were thinking about and what they were trying to bring to LA at different times. So you have the kind of box hedges of the of the Huntington of that period, but then, and then later you have the birds of paradise and all the South African stuff that starts showing up and then the Australian stuff and the natives now. And then of course with global warming, it, it's, um, I mean, obviously our hearts really go out to people in Texas and, and the kind of experience, you know, being again, being from Indiana, the flooding, the intense storms that people experience, but I think in California with the fires and with the, you know, we've only had three inches of rainfall compared to what I think we would normally get. And, you know, we might get, you know, 
we used to be more Mediterranean. I think Mediterranean is defined by something like 12 inches. I do feel, I mean, in California, it's impossible not to feel this acute awareness of, of climate and, and the changes and just how important it really is and how much it's a part of who we are. Oh, definitely. I've started gardening too, as a matter of fact, and I got a huge, like kind of um, learning a lot about natives. So, yeah. I mean, especially since we do deal with climate change in California and the dryness. Yeah. Um, that's been fun. So. And so this is Egypt, Egypt tree. Uh, where does that title come from? <laughs> well, it's so funny because I was like obsessing about this last night. I was like, Egypt, Egypt. I just love that. Tree. I love that title, you know, like, but I love it because I love the, it's a song. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a song from Egyptian Lover, which is like this one man sort of band. Um, uh, what is his name? I think it's Greg Broussard. And mm -hmm. he was known as Egyptian Lover. That was his moniker. And what's he that? was like this sort of hip hop electro dude. Okay. And you probably know the song if you heard it. Okay. And it, I had rediscovered it. I listen to it sometimes in the studio. I make my students listen to it. And they like, the thing about when I like teach college or whatever, my highest compliment is when they ask me for my playlist and they often do. <laughs> <laughs> and this is on it. I mean, I, was, I, I play it and then I'm like really upset if they don't like have a response to it. I'm like, guys, like, don't you understand how good this song is? Like, don't you understand where this is coming from? Like, you don't know anything about music. Like, this is the origins. Like, so yeah, so there's this, <laughs> this song. And it, I know it's funny that it applies to this painting, but it does. I feel like this painting is very like fantastical in a way. And uh -huh. this painting is about escape uh -huh. and it, it's definitely about escaping to a place that you can't get to, or maybe you can't get to, I don't know. But um, again, like I do fantasize a lot and I can be an introvert at times. And so I find a lot of escapism in my paintings and this is something I've always done. And I just love that song. Like it takes me to a weird, it just takes me to another place. And I love that idea. Like I love that, that it's like kind of a universal uh, kind of feeling like landscape is kind of universal. I think sometimes my paintings are very visionary and kind of like, you know, I think it's, it's kind of more universal to get into a landscape is a universal kind of thing. Like we all deal with landscape and, yeah. um, but it, it, it's still kind of fantasy this one. So anyway, they're sort of going one. back to, to titles like tree of Andromeda and Ovid's forest and is there a connection between the way you talk about myths or kind of I mean you've been ascribed as having a personal cosmology um is there a connection between those things and the feelings of escape that you're describing I don't know I don't know how to answer that <laughs> you don't have to say more to that, say more to that question Philip I think I'm trying to figure out the question um, I guess that for me, I've had a lot of great times recently thinking about myth. Um, my son's 12 and, and it's just a part of, you know, growing up is reconnecting with these kinds of ideas. And, um, I don't know, just, I've, 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 I've been finding myth to be really interesting and, and thinking about stories and stories that oh, are yeah. being for like people. Okay, now I get it. I know what you're saying now. Okay, because I thought you were like personal myth and I'm like, I don't know about personal well, so That was a separate thing because there was a writer who said that you had a personal cosmology. And when people say that an artist has a personal cosmology, I'm like, we all have a personal cosmology. I'm not sure what that means. That's a whole backstory. That's yeah, yeah the invented. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I guess I was dealing with that, but that, you know, anyway, my other, going back to the question of, Tell us about I definitely, yeah, no, no, no. Storytelling is a big part of my work. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm coming back to landscape. I was doing landscape, you know, for my kind of thesis in CalArts in 2000. And yeah. 
um, back then I was thinking a lot, when I first started thinking about it, I was thinking about just flatness and painting itself because that's what you do at CalArts. Yeah. Um, and so- That's interesting to hear you yeah, say Yeah, and so I was really into mm -hmm. the learning about the American landscape artists and like Hudson River School. And mm -hmm. I was really interested in Courier Knives, the printmakers. Mm -hmm. The images are so strange. Yes. And so specific to America. And there's something just really weird about them Mm -hmm. um, that I just loved. And I was trying to talk about my experience as a Southerner. So the work was kind of Southern Gothic. I, I guess I could describe it that way. Um, mm -hmm. It was trying to describe something underneath, like the underbelly of like, uh, of what the South is. It's a beautiful place, but there's a darkness to it. And so I definitely think I was, I really like to tell stories through myth. I mean, that's a really grand way of doing it. Um, but again, another universal way of, 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 of telling stories is, yeah, going back to mythology. And I do that, I definitely do that in my work. And I definitely did it like, especially in the Andromeda series that I did in 2015, it's kind mm -hmm. of started there. So what provoked the series? Who is Andromeda? I invented these muses that I, was was collaborating with and they were like part machine part from nature and they were like their whole purpose was to restore balance to the universe like ecological balance mm -hmm. so it was just kind of really fun kind of a feminist way of looking re-looking at myths through kind of a feminist lens mm -hmm. and it really exploded in this really nice way i just felt like this full freedom to do whatever i wanted and they kind of went in a lot of directions they were much more figurative um that series but i did make a lot of like flower um images too and i was that's when i was really starting to break up the space in this really interesting way and um i was really thinking about the organism versus the structure and that was like what these um the figures were like they were part organic and part structure so that kind of like went in other directions and kind of applied to other work i was doing and it's still in my work. It's like, there's still the structuralism versus the organicism. Um, the formal thing is still there. That's from the from that work. You know, one idea that I've always found really interesting is when you hear a writer say that they invented a character and then in a way the writing happens because the character starts telling its own story. Did you experience yeah. anything like that having a character in your work? Totally, totally. I mean, I think that's why I did it. I really didn't want to have to to tell the story all the time. It felt burdensome. And going to CalArts again, I go back to that, even though that's a long time ago, I there was there was a question of like, why are you painting? And I'm like, dude, I'm a painter. That's why I got into the school because I was I'm painting. I, I don't know how to answer that question. Right. And that was like beat into you back then. Like that was the Michael Asher days. And so after that, I was traumatized. Yeah. And so later on, when I felt good about being a painter again, um, things just kind of unfolded in a nice way for me. And eventually after well, what happened is my father died and I went through a lot and uh, I just kind of exploded with this creative energy. I just wanted to kind of prove something to myself. And uh, it was really nice to kind of tell a story in that way and to try to figure myself out that way. And that that's kind of what I was doing is kind of soul searching and that work. Um, and it was really, I mean, I still feel like sometimes I can collaborate with them if I want to. Like sometimes I'm like, are they, is this through their lens or is this through my lens? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I think I'm much more in touch with the work <laughs> with the images. You know, it's like a one-to-one -one thing now. You know, I'm more in my body, but yeah, yeah, I really do enjoy it. That's really interesting. So in a, did you use the word collaboration? Just yeah. That, you? So you're saying that, that you're kind of, when you're painting this, you know, notion of of something else as being possibly a generative idea, even if you know, you know that it comes, it all comes from you, you know, originally. It gives you something to kind of play off of or triangulate in. It sounds like. Is that sound like what you're how you're just? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'm doing it less. So I'm aware that I'm doing it less. So I think I got more kind of interested in memory, and I think memory is you know definitely of the self. Um, so I definitely think 
that imagination piece, the, the sort of visionary piece, that's something I've always associated with. Um, I think of myself as being interested in that type of space in a painting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's definitely always going to be a part of me. But um, I'm definitely, I think there's something about sensory memory and sensorial relationships that I've really lately been interested in. And that comes from me mm -hmm. um, more. And I think that's like what I was doing with those collaborators. Mm -hmm. It's just that there was a little touching on a little bit of a different subject. Well, you also did talk about in, um, and, and in, this is a, 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 the, a new, the newest piece that, that you've made. Um, you also talked about in one of the things I read, your connection to being on, on a river and fishing. That really was very evocative to me in terms of a bodily feeling of a very certain kind of exper experience. And I thought that was, that's an interesting way to also reflect on how, on how, uh, in, on your work too, I think. I definitely think that's a big part of my work now, especially um, in, I, you know, especially when I'm in LA, I'm think like I said, I'm thinking about Tennessee a lot and what I miss. It's always like the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Um, since I lost my dad, I definitely, he kind of imbued that in me, that kind of like be one with nature. You know, we, mm -hmm. we started fishing when I was very little. We lived on a houseboat on the weekends. He wow. named the houseboat, the Laurie Ann. Yeah. You know, like it was very special. It was very sweet. And uh, it is something that is ingrained in me and it's very special about my childhood. And so it is something that's just there. Like I love to be on a river. I love the water. You know, it's just, it's a place that I have to go each summer. I have to go to the river. I have to go to Arkansas yeah. and uh, get on the river. So and the seeing and experiencing um, nature is it's, it's, imbued in my in my memories. So I think that comes out in my work a lot. I mean, it's, it's, you know, making me think on a personal note, my father also passed away, at, but um, I love walking and he loved walking and growing up in Indiana. Um, he had crazy 1970s eyeball problems like you know, detached retinas where they like put the weird sticks in your eyes and all kinds of yeah. that stuff that, that unfortunately will no doubt happen to me, especially with our use of computers. Um, but he was really into mushrooms and his vision wasn't that great. And I obviously was a lot closer to the ground. So we spent a lot of time hunting for, <laughs> hunting for mushrooms <laughs> and walking all through the woods in Indiana where I'm from Bloomington, but Owen County, which is the, where the county where he was. And he made friends with all those farmers. And I don't know how he did it, but you know, he, he they would walk eaten. all over the place and we just would be out forever, like in the woods. Did you eat the mushrooms or did you ever harvest and eat them? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, not only did, I mean, all kinds of these amazing things that happen, you know, like I remember fi we found an act, a hen of the woods, which is a, you know, it's a big deal. Like that's a, you go to the Hollywood farmer's market and you're going to prepare to shell out for a head of the woods. And it's like, <laughs> this big around. But also another really, really funny one uh, was, uh, let's see if I'm getting this right, but it's called a chanterelle. Um, but there's another very similar mushroom to it that's called a jack-o'-lantern that's poisonous. And the only way to know if, it, if it's that, lan that one, I think that it's, it's that in the chanterelle, but it might be a different one that the jack-o'-lantern is similar to, but it glows in the dark. And uh, yes, yeah, so it was a really great magical moment where I remember my dad deciding not to eat it and then putting it in the trash can and then later that night being like, we made the right choice. <laughs> he opened the trash can and it was glowing? Yes, totally. It was amazing. That's so, insane. I know. Well, we're almost here to the end. And Lori, I really appreciate your giving me this time and, and sharing with us. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about this painting? Since this is a painting that you literally posted on Instagram just a couple of days ago uh, before we go. Or if you have any final thoughts that you might like to add. 
this uh, uh, came from my, like, I've been really into Monk, and I think that's in the zeitgeist. A lot of my friends are thinking about Monk. Sure. Um, I, it's just, and it's funny because you just did that talk with uh, Sky, and he was talking about the Monk painting, that the iconic Monk painting, that's the one I was thinking about, too. Obviously, this is a tiny painting. Sure. Um, and I, I don't make those kinds of paintings. I don't make those sublime types of paintings, but um, right. I really, like, wanted to try to make my own version of that. Right. Uh, and that's how this one started. And it definitely went through a lot of iterations that are very interesting <laughs> to look back on. Uh, this painting was a lot of things, but um, I really like how it, it turned out. And I like just, it, I found it very meditative. I put it away for a while and kind of like came back to and worked on it again. And I just enjoyed that, the mark making kind of the, you know, the, like marks in this one. Yeah. Like, well, small your paintings have mm -hmm. different moments of there's a kind of well we're just going to get right back into it but there's a there's a, a kind of lot there's a logic to the different parts and how they function and i really appreciate you're kind of illuminating some of those different aspects of the paintings for us here today yeah so thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate it laura you giving us the time i really appreciate everybody coming um we are open by appointment if you're here in la uh feel free to come by uh we have pieces of Lori's up, our current show, Sky Glabish, and our thoughts really go out to everybody here during COVID and everything that's been happening to people. It's just such a tumultuous time, but, um, you know, a, a time of all kinds of interesting discovery and, and such as well. So thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks a lot, Lori. We'll see you around. Thanks. <laughs>